Well, we are live and waiting for some folks to join in. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Sister Shana, Sister Maria. Good to see you. Sister Pat. <laughs> Sister Angela. Brother Maurice. Good to see you guys. Amen. Sister Ayana. All the early birds. Wow. Brother Maurice and family. Good to see everybody. Sister Ayana. Amen. Amen. Sister Jeanette. Good to see you. Good to see you. Sister Jennifer. Wow, all the early birds, this is wonderful. And I'm sure that there are people that's probably logged in, but they're not saying anything. Um, welcome to you as well. <laughs> Amen. Hi, Lori. Hi, Linda. Good to see you guys. It's good to be here. And um, I'm glad for this opportunity to uh, be let back in your homes. And um, I believe God has got a word for us tonight. We're going to worship the Lord. Let's just wait for a few more people to come on in. For he is worthy to be praised. I hope everybody had a great week and certainly a great day. In the midst of COVID um, stresses, and, uh, the COVID mindset, the restrictions and everything that's happening, I'm just praying that God will keep each and every one of you and not let you fear, not let you worry. And I was just talking with someone today how they're so depressed, they're feeling so down, and um, they can't go anywhere. You know, this is not a good time for a lot of people. But I want you to know something. We cannot let the restrictions pull you down, bring you into depression. You can't let that happen. And for the safety of all, I, I, I see and understand the need for people to go out and um, out west, down south, they're going crazy. They're going out to restaurants and having all kinds of things happening in their lives as though they were normal. They're not wearing masks and uh, people are getting sick. I know you don't want to quarantine. I know you don't want to put on your mask, <laughs> but you know what? Uh, we need to be safe and you may be okay, but if you're a carrier of the virus, you could perhaps uh, or potentially get someone else sick and uh, even cause them to die. I'm sure you don't want that on your conscience. So let's just use this time to grow personally, um, read, study, um, not just the word of God. And yes, but, you know, whatever it is, if you're in business, uh, get, you know, a little deeper into what you're um, trying to accomplish in your business. If you are in school, put your everything into it. And uh, if you're just working normally, you know what? Spend time with, with your family. Isn't that wonderful? But prior to COVID, a lot of people didn't have a chance to spend time with their families. And they were saying, oh my goodness, I just wish I had the chance to just, just, just spend some time with my family. Well, uh, you've got a lot of time now. Don't let it go to waste. This too shall pass. Amen. Why don't we pray? We have a lot, lot enough people on so that we can start. And um, let's ask God to just bless us, bless our minds, our spirits. Help us to let go of um, the depression and the anxieties and everything that's trying to uh, take away your joy, steal your peace. Amen. So why don't we just go before the presence of the Lord right now and um, let's pray. And if you have any prayer requests in your heart, in your minds because you've been thinking about somebody else. Let's pray for them right now. Master, we come before you. We are so ever grateful for all that you have done. And God, you have given us this wonderful opportunity, this space of time, God, over these last few months to be able to, Lord God, reset, to be able to think differently, God, think out of the box, if you will. I believe, God, that you are trying to reach the minds and the hearts of your children. I also believe with all of my heart that, God, you're trying to do a work with the church that has never been done before. And that, God, even though it may seem to a lot of people, especially your people, 
as though there is a curse upon this world. My God, if your people could only see the move of God, they would understand that God, you are about to, and Lord, have been blessing the church. There are people that are struggling in the world today with no hope, no help. They're jumping out of windows, God. They're committing suicides in so many different ways. They're disconnecting from the world because they are so lost in their minds and in their hearts. They're in homes with many people, but they're still feeling alone. God, I pray that you take away that depression, that fear, that doubt, that, that anxiety, God, and especially um, from among your people, that God, people will begin to lift up your name, lift up the gift, Lord God, that you've placed within them, whatever that gift may be, so that they may shine brighter than any light that has ever shone, mighty God, in the kingdom of God, that they may exemplify you in every way. God, we are praying today for those that are sick and afflicted, praying today for those, God, who are still in the hospital after many weeks or months, God, and God, they don't know what's going to happen. God, family members are just so stressed out. I pray for those people, Lord God, that, Lord God, a miracle will take place for them. For those who have lost somebody, God, I pray for them, God, that you would bring peace into their hearts and into their homes. Don't let the dark clouds of depression reign over them, God, but let your peace that passes all understanding guard their hearts and their minds. Lord, I pray that during this time, your people will, God, Lord, begin to guard our hearts and our minds with prayer, with the word of God and with God a fresh outlook God Lord a spiritual outlook a spiritual worldview if you will we're so grateful God for the people of God that have been so faithful not only to New Life Apostolic Church but all the churches that they attend God and people Lord God have not given up and we are grateful for that because the church Lord God will never fail you said Lord the gates of hell will never prevail against the church I believe with all of my heart that no matter what the devil does no matter what plan he puts in place that they have already failed God and we glorify you I pray that somebody's worshiping with me right now that somebody is just praying amen and just seeking the face of God and saying God I need your spirit right now God, I've been dealing with this depression. I've been dealing with this anxiety. And, and Lord, I need your strength. I just need to be lifted out of this, God. Some of you, you're waiting for the next um, broadcast or you're going and you're looking at other things on Facebook and YouTube to try to lift your spirits. And I get that. I, there's nothing wrong with that. But try to establish a, a, a relationship with God so that if the internet goes out and you can't find anybody to lift you up and all the phones went dead and there's nobody that you can call, that you can still be lifted up with Jesus. Amen? Because you see, that's what it's all about. My relationship is not with the pastor. My relationship is not with the other brother or sister that has been so instrumental in lifting my spirits. My relationship with, is, is with Jesus Christ the one who died for me, that bled for me. Amen. My brother didn't die for me. My, my sister didn't bleed for me, but Jesus did. And so I want us to just keep that in mind because if things were to happen, if, uh, you know, an EMP, that's an electromagnetic pulse were to be deployed and we lost all ability to communicate, no mobile phones and we lose internet, what would we do? Would the people of God lose their minds or are we saying, God, I'm going to take this time to change my worldview? And that's what these Bible studies each week has been pretty much about. Amen. The meaning of life. It's not just about trying to understand what's going on in your life, but to make that shift, to change your worldview, to say, God, I want to see the world the way you see the world, not the way I see the world. Folks, remember, we're flawed. So when you're trying to see things from your own personal understanding, it just never works. I always pray, God, give me your mind. Help me to see things through your eyes. Because when I try to see things through my eyes, I mess it up every single time. Pastor, you? Uh, yeah, me. That's right. No one is perfect. We see through our eyes. We are flawed because of sin. Amen. We're not perfect yet. That day is coming when this body shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. When the, the trump of God shall sound and Jesus takes his church out of here. But for now, the idea is to seek him, seek his face, try to think like him. That's why we go to the word. When you can be objective enough to say, God, I don't want my theology 
That's man's view of God. My theology to skew my view of your word. I don't want to see your word based on what man is saying, God. I pray you open up the word of God so that I can see the way you want me to see. Amen. Can I get an amen from somebody? And so today we're going to start right now. And again, the meaning of life, we're going to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and beginning at verse 1. And we're going to read four verses. And then we're going to Ecclesiastes chapter 10 during the lesson. So we're going to follow chapter 9 for a while. And then we're going to go to chapter 10. Hallelujah. Amen. Does anybody love the word out there? Hallelujah. Do you love the word? Amen. The Bible says that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, O Lord. You know, I, I love teaching. I love preaching the word. It's not so much that I love teaching and preaching it, but when I'm studying, it just opens up my understanding so much more. And that part of it, I love so much more than even actually teaching or even preaching. Isn't that something? Because when I'm digging into the word, I see those nuggets. I see the gems in the word of God, the rubies in the word of God, the gold, the precious stones in the word of God. So let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and beginning at verse 1. Hallelujah. It says here, So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, to, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes that everything that happens under the sun. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. And so this is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil. And there is, amen, here it is, madness in their hearts. And so while they live and afterwards they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. Now, I kind of rushed reading through that, but we're going to take it verse by verse and even go beyond the four verses so that you can get a better understanding of what the preacher was talking about here. So the first thing I want us to look at is enduring the inevitability of life. When you see what the preacher is talking about, he says, listen, I'm living life, but I don't understand if God is with me, why do I see the evils in the world that I see? I'm living life, but I don't get it. The more I worship God, I, I fast and I pray and I, and I live for God, it just seems like my own family keeps getting sick or losing their jobs or there's a problem or uh, the same for myself. I, Lord, I don't get it. There is something about life. You know, when you're born, we know that you're never, you're not going to live forever. You're going to born and you're going to die. That's what the Bible says. We are born to die. And there is a time and a season for everything under the sun. And so, the, 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 the preacher was beginning to understand that he had wasted his life. If he had understood these things at the beginning of his life, his entire life would have been an awesome life because he recognized some things and we're going to go through those things to, tonight. But enduring the inevitability, and there's some things that are inevitable, the in, in, inevitability of life and death, verses 1 through 10, you can read those at your leisure, but I want to just share a few things with you. We are in the hand of God. That's the first thing I want you to understand. We are in the hand of God. God will direct our paths. God is going to direct your path. I know you're going to go through some struggles and you don't know whether to go right or left, but God is going to direct your path if you learn how to wait on him. Don't rush doing some things. Amen. Some people love to rush. 
If God doesn't answer within your five minutes, it's like you just want to just go and rush and do whatever you want to do. And that's where we mess up. There's no wisdom in that. There's just an individual that just wants to get this done now because I'm sick and tired of feeling the pressure of it. Did you ever stop to think that that pressure might just be Satan trying to make you make the wrong decision? That if you were just to be patient and wait, that God would open a door for you, a better door for you. But instead, we rush things. And so we are in the hand of God. We should say, God, have your way. Amen. Sometimes we don't get that. But Lord, have your way. Saying, Lord, have your way with our words is one thing. But when you say, God, have your way, and you're waiting on him, God is saying, now that's what I'm looking for. Because now you give God an opportunity to work on your behalf. When you're rushing stuff, God can't work faster than you're rushing. Come on, somebody. Because God has given us the choice to make. Wait on him or move ahead without him. So we need to understand we are in the hand of God. And the righteous and the wise will seek to know God's ways. So when we're waiting on him, we're going to say, God, show me the best path. It takes prayer. It takes waiting on God. We don't pray and say, God, where's my answer? And if you don't get the answer from God, you call a pastor or you call a best friend. You know how it is on some of these game shows. You know, call a friend. Call a family. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what? Sometimes we just need to put the phone down and just say, wait, because that friend may may tell you that they had a dream that this morning about you and, and, and they felt like God wants you to move ahead with what you're doing and that there, there's no God in that. So you have to learn how to wait. Remember what the scripture says? Every man, that means every man, every woman, every boy, every girl must learn how to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. That means I can't work it out for you. I can't tell you to go right nor left. If God gives me a word and I know it is, I'll say to you, God gave me a word for you, but I want you to pray over it. Amen. You need to pray over it. And you need to be willing because sometimes we're not willing. We're, we want a blessing, but we don't want to go through the trial. Remember the sermon on Sunday where Mary was told by the angel, you're about to be blessed, woman. You are a, a, a woman that is blessed of God and God is going to do a miracle and give you a baby even though you've never known a man. And Mary was like, uh, what's the catch? Well, the angel told her what the catch was. Yeah, you know what, Mary? Your circumstances won't change. You're still going to be in poverty. You know what, Mary? They're going to hate you. They're, they're going to talk about you. You know what, Mary? Uh, they're going to hate your son. Can you imagine? that tied up in the blessing was a trial. And so if you're trying to get out of that trial that you're going through, understand that trial is there to make you what you need to be. And sometimes we're running away from the trials and God is saying, no, you don't get it. You can't see what I see, God says. You don't understand what you're about to become. That um, worm, that caterpillar that is in the chrysalis, that thing, that shell after, uh, you know, it's spun in that cocoon, that thing hardens and there's no way for that caterpillar to move. There's a day, however, when that thing begins to break and out comes a beautiful butterfly. We have to learn how to wait on God. Amen, somebody. And so we, in enduring the inevitability of life and death, must understand we're in the hand of God, that God is going to direct our path, and that the righteous and the wise will seek to know God's ways. How do we do that? From Scripture. Amen. Because we see the promises of God, we understand what God has done for so many other people before us, and we say to ourselves, oh my goodness, if God did it for them, he's going to do it for me. But it's still means we have to wait. Amen, somebody. And then let's go to what happens, amen, uh, in life. You know, when we have to endure all these things. You know, life has its issues and its trials and its tribulations. Amen. Verse 2 says, all share a common destiny. That is man. All of us share common destiny. The righteous and the wicked. The good and the bad. The clean and the unclean. Now, in general, this is true. This is true in general. 
But the one thing becomes very clear is that the people of God who seek after God's ways, God treats us differently than the wicked. Amen. So it doesn't make any difference whether the rain is falling and blessings are coming down, showers of blessings, and uh, you're saying, why is the wicked being blessed with me? I thought, God, you love me. Yes, he does. Just understand that if there are trials in your life that God is going to deal with you differently than he deals with the wicked. There's an end to the wicked. Plus, God will prolong you, your life, your, your family's life. God will bless you and, and bring you through things when the, the, the government says nobody can do this, can't do that. You find that we will have favor. The same things that happened to the children of Israel, God will do for you and I. When all the blights that hit Egypt, the frogs and the, the river turned under waters turning into blood and all of the things that happened, Amen. All of the plagues that hit Egypt, none of them came near the children of Israel. God says, I'm going to treat my people differently. So life does happen. Amen. And a godly man will be spared many things that befall the sinner in his life. Let me read two script, uh, verses of scriptures or two, two uh, uh, um, areas of scripture. Psalm 34, Psalm 37. You can follow along. That is Psalm 34, 9 through 10. It says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Did you get that? But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And in Psalm 37, it says in verse 1, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And so God is saying, wait a second, my people are different. It doesn't make any difference what's happening out in the world. I expect a different worldview from my people. I expect a different attitude from my people. I expect my people to chase after me in spite of whatever else is going on. I know y'all got to go out there and get the toilet paper and the, if there's any Lysol or whatever it is, the bread, the butter, the eggs. You know what? That's a part of life. Life happens. But in the midst of all of that, let's not forget to put on that gospel tune on the car stereo and worship God all the way to the supermarket. Come on, somebody. Let's not forget that while you come back and you're trying to uh, decontaminate everything because you got to wipe everything down, make sure there is no viruses on anything that you brought in the house, that you are whispering, thank you, Lord, a prayer that, Lord, you've brought me constantly back and forth in safety, kept us safe all this time. We're still supposed to glorify God in spite of all that we're going through. Amen. And so life is going to happen, but in the midst of all that's happening, always remember to give God the glory and the praise. So we need to endure hardness, the Bible tells us, as a good soldier. Y'all remember that scripture? How about understanding that we're living in a time where death is all over the place? Death is everywhere. One of the biggest problems for us, especially Christians, not just the people in the world, but Christians, we know that when we die, we're asleep in the Lord. And um, I know some people believe that when you die, you, uh, you know, your family members that who passed on, they're running around heaven and they're watching over you. That's not scripture. You need to read the word of God. I know that's what's taught in a lot of religions, especially the Christian uh, religion, quote unquote. But that is not according to scripture. Even when Lazarus was dead, Jesus says he's asleep. The very word sleep is used in the Bible to describe death because when we die, we see it as final, but God sees that we are asleep because there's a day when the trump shall be sounded by an angel, by an archangel, and we will pop open our eyes if we have already gone to the grave. Come on, somebody. And those who are still alive will just be translated. Our bodies will be changed and we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We are asleep as far as God is concerned. So death is something that is all, all just just seems to be such a finality about it. And because of that, and because we're seeing so much death, there is no other time in my entire life 
And I've lived to see just you know, a hot minute here and there in my life. And can I tell you something? I've never experienced anything like this. And there are grandparents, people who are older than I am. They've never seen anything like this. Great grandparents who are still alive, they've never seen anything like this. That COVID has caused all of us to experience death. People close to us. It's touched every block. Come on. Every city, every country. This is not a good thing because it's depressing. Let's admit it for what it is. It's depressing. But don't let what is so real to the sight, the hearing, because you see things and hear things, you feel things. You know, our senses are being impacted in a negative way. But we're people of God and we know better. We know that death is not final. But because death is here, it causes us to become depressed, feel down, anxious, not wondering, I mean, wondering what's going to happen next. And so it causes your days, even on a sunny day, to feel so dark, doesn't it sometimes? I know I'm talking to a lot of you out there. And, and, and some of you, you're just high on Jesus and you don't feel none of this. Good for you. But can I tell you, you're probably in the point zero 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 one percent of people. The majority of people are going to feel distraught. People are going to feel like, oh my God, I don't know if I can take another week of this. But can I tell you something? Our God is still on the throne. He has not gone anywhere. So let's get to that. Death is inevitable. Yes, the dead, verse 5 says, no, not anything, neither have they any more a reward. In other words, the, whoever has gone on to be with the Lord, they're, they're not worried about the bills. They're not worried about... Um, the mortgage, they're not worried about the crazy boss on the job. They're not worried about anything like that, right? Because there is no more reward. You know, you're not going to be able to go to the mall and chill, buy the new kicks, um, you know, get some new uh, clothes, whatever. No, you know what? When you're gone to the grave, none of that matters. You're asleep waiting for the day of judgment or the day of resurrection. Amen. Where we're caught up to meet with the Lord. So if you die in the Lord, You'll wait for that trumpet of God to sound and you'll be raised to meet him in the air. The Lord is going to say, welcome, my good and faithful servant. Come into the joys of your Lord. So we want that, but we still have to deal with the fact that, yes, we're going to lose loved ones. People are going to die, not just from COVID, but even from just, you know, natural causes. And so we can't allow those things to bring us down. Death may be inevitable, inevitable. But there's also a resurrection. And the Bible tells us that during that time, rewards will be meted out. Those who have done evil in their bodies, they will receive a just reward. Those who have done good, those who have been obedient to Scripture, to do what God says will bring you into relationship with Him. That is repentance being baptized in the precious name of Jesus, to take on the name of Jesus, to be covered by his blood so that he can pour his spirit into you. Amen. But while all of that is going on, while we're dealing with death, we have to understand that the wicked may not care and they seem to be blessed, but a day of judgment is coming. And on that day, God is going to judge the good, the bad, and whatever we have done in our bodies Amen. Every word spoken, and we're going to get to that. Amen. Every deed done, will we will be judged. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 tells us, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Amen. So, should I worry about these things? Pastor, what am I supposed to do? Should, should, should I just, you know, try to crank myself up, play some gospel music um, at its loudest and have my neighbors come bang on my door and tell me to shut up because my music is too loud. I'm singing too loud in the apartment building and people are trying to bang on the door to tell me to shut up. Amen. No, 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 no. You know what? It is not about what we do. It is about what we believe that shifts and changes our thinking to become more Christ oriented so that we can change our worldview so that no matter what's going on outside, hmm, we are not impacted by it like others are impacted by it. When the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, we haven't been fishing, so we don't have any money. And the Romans, they expect everybody to pay taxes. What do we do? There is no money, Lord. We need to pay taxes. 
And should we really be paying taxes, Lord? Should we really? Because after all, you came to set up your kingdom here. So shouldn't we ignore Caesar and just pay attention to you? And the Lord says, listen to me. You give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and you give to God what belongs to God. We are living in a world, so we're going to see some things out there. We're going to be impacted by it, but we don't have to worry about whether or not it should be a, 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 a decisive moment or issue or, or event in my life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Those things, I see them, I hear them. And I may even experience some emotional um, response to some of those things, but they don't define me and I don't have to let them come in and shift me from the blessing that God has placed in my life. What is a blessing? Peace of mind. What's a blessing? My family being saved. What's a blessing? That God still puts food on the table. Come on, somebody. Amen. And gives me the ability to exist every single day. So the, 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 the writer here says, while you're looking at those things, enjoy life. Enjoy life. Amen. Ecclesiastes 9, 7 through 10. I'm not going to read those verses. But while he, what he was saying here was while death is inevitable, we should still enjoy life. In other words, live joyfully with, with the wife that God has given to you, sir with the husband that God has given to you, ma'am, with your yourself. Some people, they're, they're, they're just very happy by themselves. Amen. Work diligently while you're here. You won't be able to do do any work while you, you're gone. You know, Jesus says work while it is day because the night comes when no man can work. In other words, while there's life and breath, enjoy life. Come on now, enjoy life. Don't look at the things that seem to hamper you, burden you. Why do I have to do that? That I don't like doing that. Or why do I have to do this? I don't like doing this. Some of those things are there to make you better. <laughs> Amen. To make you better. To make some changes in your life that you don't see, but God sees them. God sees what you need down the road. You don't see it, but God does. And so he's not going to lift those things out of your life, no matter how much you pray, because God wants them there to change you, to toughen you up. Amen. And as the Bible said, I quoted the scripture before, that we should endure hardness as a good soldier. You know, soldiers don't just go out and fight battles, do they? They go through boot camp. But you know what? Those soldiers who just go through boot camp, uh, it's not enough. It really isn't enough to just go through six months, depending on what you're go how you're going to serve. Some actually, if you're going to go into spe special ops and so on and so forth, you need longer training because you have to be immersed in situations. You have to experience being tortured. That's right. You have to go through some grueling things that can literally even kill you during the process of training. And actually, some do, do, do die. And so when you're enduring hardness as a good soldier and you're going through some things, God is saying there's a battle coming, but you're not prepared now. But you will be after you go through this. Yes, that thing that you don't want to go through right now. And because of those things, you don't enjoy life. You sit and whine about the, the process, but you're letting life go by you. This is what the preacher saw. Solomon saw that he stressed out over the process. He stressed out over the trials and he stressed out over the tribulations. He stressed out over the hardships and never really gave himself to God in the way he should have. And you know what? When he was older, he understood that he should have enjoyed life while he was living. So while death may be inevitable, he said we should still enjoy life. And you see, Solomon isn't condoning living a carefree life here. That's not what he's saying. He had done that. He had lived a carefree life and found out that there was no happiness. He had lived a life without God being the focus, and he found out there was no happiness. So whether he lived and had all the means, he was rich, he could do whatever he wanted to do, he could buy whatever he wanted, he could live anywhere he wanted to live. His houses were beautiful. But you know what? He wasn't happy. And he saw that at the end of his days. Why did it take him so long? Because he kept chasing after the same things. Different ways, but he never stopped the search and never included God 
as the first thing that he searched for. Isn't that wonderful that he found out later? But I, I would dare say that it would have been much greater. It would have been a wonderful thing for him to have found it earlier on in his life so that he would have had a better life. Does having joy in your life mean that there is no trial? No. Does having peace mean no stress, no anxiety? No. But you see, we see things differently. We manage things differently. And we become, and we're going to get into that, more wise in the ways of the Lord. So we need to work diligently. Colossians chapter 3. I didn't put that up here. Forgot to put the, the, um, the, the location of it. But Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, 2, and 3. Colossians 3, 1, through 2, and 3 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Did, did you get that? The scripture is so clear in what it's saying here. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ, right? Seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He says here, set your minds, set your minds. The way I think has to change. Amen. The way I'm influenced mentally has to change. I can't just let everything that comes along in my life or things that people do to me constantly buffet me because those things take up your, your focus and your ability to do what God wants you to do. So you're going to miss opportunities because you're focusing on the negatives. You're going to miss a window and a, and a door opening to you because you're so focused on this thing that just happened to you and you can't disconnect from it. And so you end up missing the wonderful opportunity to see what God wants. Amen. So when you think about it, you have to consider what the Bible says. So we have to enjoy life. Amen. So while death is inevitable, we should enjoy life. We should work diligently. So if you're raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. But look at verse two, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So let's shift then to enduring the uncertainties of life. Amen. There are some uncertain things that are going to happen in your life and you just have to say, God, I need you. I, I just need you to help me every day, God. I, I, I have a proclivity, God, to just become depressed so easily, God, or to become anxious. I, there's just something about my spirit, God, that I'm trying my best, but no matter what I do, no matter how much I pray and fast, these things just keep happening. Let me tell you, in music, we have something that is called learning by rote. So if you're going to teach a choir a song, you, you become repetitive. You keep singing the same things over and over till they get it right, till they keep hit, hitting uh, the right notes, the, the correct notes, those high notes that they say they can't hit, but you know they can. You work with them and you practice with them until they can hit that note. You may find out that they can't keep that high note for a while. So musically, you may have to kind of shift and not hold the note. But if you want the music to be beautiful, you have to learn how to tell people they're not doing something right. And some of us don't want to hear that. When you're not doing it right, that's what the word does. That's what the preaching and the teaching does. It says, sir, man, brother, sister, you're not doing it right. You're not hitting that note. Many years ago, um, it was difficult for me, um, you know, to tell people, listen, you're not hitting the note because people get so upset and angry, you know, when you, you, you kind of tell them you're not doing something right. And that's a problem with our society today. There's a lack of wisdom in our society. You know what? For those of you who lead choirs and you, you're, you're in groups or you're a manager, say it nicely, but they need to know because you'll never get something right if you're constantly worried about somebody not taking it correctly, yes, they'll get over it, but you got to do it right. So you let them know, no, that's not the note. Keep practicing and work with them. It's the same in your own life. You got to say, God, I keep messing up. I can't get to that place, God, where you got to practice. You got to get to that place where the next trial that comes, you said, you know what? I'm not letting this get me down. You've got to keep doing that. You've got to be conformed. Amen. Not be, not be conformed rather to the world or to the way Satan wants you to think, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Every day you pour Jesus in, you pour the word in, you pour good thoughts in, you say, God, I'm going to make it. God, I will not let this bother me and then actively work at it. Amen, somebody. 
See, that's the thing. We want God to bring it, put it in our laps, give us a miracle of shift and change with no, no work at all on our part. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The Bible says you and I must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. There's some work there. It's not of works lest any man should boast. You know what that's talking about? Salvation. Amen. This salvation that comes to you and I. I did not get saved by my own works. It was the blood of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. But when it comes to living for God, I've got to say no to some things. Amen. I believe it was Nancy Reagan many, many years ago that started that whole thing about saying no to drugs. Just say no. I may be wrong. Some of y'all can write me and correct me. But the bottom line is somebody has to say no. And so we have to learn how to say no to ourselves. No, that is not right. No, I'm not going to think that way. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm going to let God do it. You keep saying that you're going to begin to shift your mind and the way you think. So expect the unexpected, he says, in life, verses 11 through 12. What does he mean by that? You see, time and chance happens to all men, time and chance. So when we're, 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 we're living in our lives, some things will happen to us, amen, and, and, and it'll, it'll just happen to you, 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 you without you even knowing. Being swift, being strong, being wise, being smart, being educated doesn't stop you from having something happen to you in life. But you have to uh, learn how to un endure the uncertainties of life and understand that some things are going to happen. The car is going to break and you didn't expect it to break. Amen. You might get laid off from, from a job and you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't even see this coming. We don't know what the uncertainties of life will bring, but we know what God, the songwriter says, I know who holds the future and I know who holds my hand. Many of things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds the future and I know who holds my hand. And sometimes death can come unexpectedly. We've seen that even during these last few months. But let's put it in God's hands. And when the, the, your loved one dies in the Lord to rejoice, amen. But then we have to learn how to use wisdom, amen. We should say wisdom must be valued in my life. Esteem, that is to value something. And what is he talking about here? A simple but wise person was instrumental in saving a city from its enemies. This is what he saw. Amen. He says, you know what? I saw something in my experience. A city that should have been overrun by an enemy wasn't. Because one person used wisdom said the right thing, did the right thing at the right time and caused his enemies not to overrun his city and take them into captivity, into slavery. Sometimes wisdom is the best way to fight a battle. Amen. I know some of us, you know, we're, we're very vocal and, uh, Pastor, I don't know, I just need to give them a piece of my mind. I think what Bishop Teets uh, used to say, yeah, but be careful what's left after that. You know, we, we have to be careful how much of our minds we give. But then remember, we're practicing some things that's a part of the old nature. It's hard to get rid of because we're swift with the tongue, swift with the, the, the anger being ramped up, swift with all of those things. That's a part of human nature, and it happens to all. But if we try to practice out of it, you'll be surprised how the Holy Ghost will take you the rest of the way that you can't go. So we need to use wisdom when we're living our lives. And then let's flip to verse uh, chapter 10 real quick. Amen. Just to look at a few things here. In chapter um, 10 verse 1, he talks about people's reputations and, and how people's reputations can be ruined. Amen. Uh, uh, you know, when, when someone's reputation is, is ruined, he says it's like dead flies, uh, that that's just uh, flying over uh, a perfume uh, or an ointment. Amen. And so when you have a good reputation and some negative things are being said, it can destroy your reputation. And so we have to use wisdom when we're going through some things so that we do not lose our good character in Jesus. We do not lose our good character in Christ. Come on now. Amen. Uh, Pastor, you don't know what they said to me. It doesn't matter what they said to you. Uh, Pastor, you don't know. They kind of did this to me. It doesn't matter what they did to you. And I can you imagine others that we've been telling uh, about Christ, how much Jesus loves me and he has changed me. I'm not the same anymore. And then something happens 
and we are exactly what we told them we were not. Amen. And so we have to consider those things. You see, when we consider the ointment that 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 is that is uh, tarnished by the putrefaction of having flies go into it, that's folly. Folly deplored. We don't want to be foolish or have a lack of good sense. That is folly. When we're dealing with life, it serves as if, you know we, we, wisdom or folly that is can serve as an unsafe guide. We're thinking that we have wisdom when it's folly. Man's wisdom is folly. The way you and I see things without Christ taking the lead is folly. This is what he was talking about. He said, I made, I'm, Solomon was the wisest man in the world, the wisest man. But the things that he did and the decisions that he made all led into some very, very dark places for his life. He made decisions that led him away from God. Yes, he made decisions that did a lot of wonderful things as a leader. But he also made some very bad decisions as a leader. Wise in some ways, but very foolish. He called that folly. And so the uncertainty of our lives should never lead us to make unwise decisions or allow our emotions to creep up to the place where we're making unwise decisions. Amen. And so when you do that, you allow your wisdom to be an unsafe guide in your life. The wise man's heart is at his right hand, the Bible says. The fool's heart is at his left hand. Do you know what that means? It means that his heart is in the wrong place. The wise man, the one who's following God, his heart is on his right hand. Amen. But the fool's heart is on the left. It's because... He is making the wrong decisions. His heart is in the wrong place. So um, a man of, of God, a woman of God, whose understanding is, 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 is based on the word of God, based on the spirit of God moving in you, shifting your emotions, making you different than what you were yesterday, last week, the year before, making you so unlike who you were, causes you to be more a hearer of God's voice than your own wisdom. You know, there are lots of Christians that's out there that's constantly having dreams. I'm, I mentioned this on Sunday as well, and 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 visions and dreams, and, and their own desires are producing these dreams because they know what they want deep in their hearts. You have so-called prophets out there prophesying all kinds of things, and God is not in it. You know what I notice about the Word of God? The other day I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about all the prophets, whether it was Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elisha, Elijah, Ezekiel. These prophets, even John the Baptist, these prophets were never considered prophets who heard from God. In fact, they were ridiculed. Jeremiah had the priests arrest him so many times, beat him up, and, 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 and throw him in jail. His reputation was just gone to the dogs. Those are the ones that God is using. Not everybody that says that they're a prophet is a prophet. And not everybody that speaks into your life, you should allow them to speak into your life. Amen. So be careful of who's guiding you and what you're allowing to guide your life because it may be unsafe. God is not in it. Let's look at folly. That's foolishness. Deplored. Amen. We should deplore it. You know what? Folly betrays its own stupidity. Amen. Folly betrays its own stupidity. A fool, the Bible says, walks along the way without wisdom. A fool walks along the way without wisdom. What does that mean? He shows everybody that he's a fool. Doesn't even realize it. It doesn't mean that this person is uneducated. Mm -mm, that's not what this means. It doesn't mean that this person is a babbling idiot walking down the street just talking to him or herself. That's not what this is saying. It's saying that the decisions that they are making sets them apart as a fool because it's always pushing them in the wrong direction and it's away from God. You know what that the Bible tells us? That, that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Pastor, I don't say that there is no God. I believe in God. I know we do. But sometimes we make so many decisions without him. Or we don't wait on him. That's just as bad. And we have become very foolish in the way we have made our decision. So let's be careful about that. Amen. He shows everybody that he's a fool. And that's something we don't want in our lives. Let's look at folly. 
Here again, the foolishness, the lack of good sense, how it's manifested. Amen. When the spirit of the ruler rises against you, amen, the, don't leave your post. If a ruler becomes angry with you, don't leave your post. Submit, even though they're not doing the right thing, and pacify him to secure yourself. In other words, the, the supervisor just said something very demeaning and, 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 and derogatory to you, and then you just lash out at them, and then you lose your job. Now, you've just given that person exactly what they wanted. They didn't care anything about you in the first place. They just don't want you around. And now you've given them a wonderful opportunity to fire you. Now they have witnesses. You see what I'm saying? That's the devil. Amen. Don't give in to the folly of fools. So if you have a boss that's not doing the right thing, you pray for them and say, God, I want you to take care of them. When folly is manifested in tyrannical leadership... Uh, you know, uh, there are some things that we see, and I'm going to leave uh, four things with you, four mistakes uh, that tyrannical or cruel rulers make. Four mistakes. Number one, immaturity. They, they, they you know, it says immaturity is given a place of prominence. So when you have bosses, for instance, who are taking someone who has no experience like you, they don't have the knowledge, the expertise like you, but because they know somebody, they set them above you. Someone who's immature, can't make wise decisions, and then they become your boss. Come on now. You see how that sometimes hurts? Because you've been praying for that promotion on the job, and here comes this boss, this tyrannical boss, this wicked ruler that says, you know what? I don't even recognize what you're bringing to the table. I'm going to put someone who has no sense. In fact, I know they're a fool, but you know what? Because I don't like you, I'm going to put them above you. You know, don't let those things bother you. God is going to deal with that individual that did that. That ruler, they're in God's hands. Always remember that. That's not your battle. Then when you think about it, um, you know, not only do uh, cruel rulers uh, set immaturity above maturity, but they degrade and demote a person who is noble and worthy because of dislike. So here you are, always living for God, never stealing time. You're always on time at work. And they just don't ever want to recognize that. Let me tell you something. They may demean you. They may demote you. But God is the one that will deal with them. That is still not your battle. These are the things that the preacher, the wise Solomon, found that were actually wise decisions. He was a ruler, and perhaps he was even talking about himself because he made some of these very same mistakes. And we have to be careful as leaders to do the right thing. But if we're under authority, allow God to deal with these people. Don't take that into your hands. Amen. And then number three, exalting an unproven person. So what he's saying here is that this person who is an upstart, if you will, is, is, is living in style. They're getting much better pay than you. And you are still struggling, even though you're a child of God. And number four, treating princes like servants among the people. He's also talking about the experienced and committed men or women being pushed aside without regard to their experience and wise counsel. You have so much to offer and still they can't see you. That's not for you to be worried about. God doesn't even want you there. Or maybe God will set you up at another time. I have known people who have struggled on jobs. And, and it seems like after many, many, many years, it was time to go. And God said to them, don't move. Do not leave. And God shut every door and they were so unhappy. And then literally in a matter of months, they were elevated. They were given crazy money. They were elevated above all their enemies. Come on, let's wait on God. Sometimes we don't understand how God is causing you and I to grow. But if you just wait on him, amen. The Bible says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Amen, amen. Be of good courage. That means you just say, God, I know you got my back. You're going you're gonna to provide. You're going to protect. You're going to keep me. Amen. So whatever the cruel ruler does, God is going to take care of you. Listen to me. 
when those who are foolish are out there doing the right, the wrong things, they are only hurting and hindering themselves. That's all they're doing. Amen. So there, there's a caution there. The trap that they have set for you is going to get them. Amen. And your accomplice, whoever they're using, whoever they're using, that accomplice is going to go right down with them. Yeah, everybody's got uh, an accomplice in crime. Yeah, you know, that crazy boss again, crazy supervisor. Um, there's that, that neighbor, amen, Sam Ballad and Tobias, when they came against the children of Israel because they were trying to build up the wall again. Amen, there's always a Sam Ballad and Tobias that's going to write those nasty letters and tell you that you can pray to your God all day long. It's not going to help you. That no matter what you do, we're going to bring uh, all our forces against you and we are going to destroy you. In fact, didn't we destroy you before? Didn't we tear down your walls? Didn't we tear down your temples before? We're going to do it again. And these poor people, they were struggling, but there's always a man of God to tell them, listen, it's going to be all right because God is on our side. Amen? So don't worry about it. Put it in God's hands no matter what they are doing. Know that God is watching these people. And in closing, I want to leave with you three thoughts. Three thoughts. Number one, the foolish seldom know how to restrain themselves. They are going to reveal themselves if you allow God to do what God wants to do. The foolish will reveal themselves. Everybody will see them for who they are. Amen. And whether it's when you're there on the job or you're in another job. I remember years later after I left a particular job, um, I actually got a phone call. It was like maybe a couple years, two, three years later. And somebody said to me, remember this person that used to do this and this and this this to you? Well, this is what happened to them. Listen, it may mean that I'm no longer there. You're no longer there. But God is going to take care of what those people did to you. So don't worry about that. Don't pray for that, though. Amen. What goes around comes around. Amen. I don't want to pray evil against anybody and open doors I can't, you know, shut. But what I'm saying is if you leave it in God's hands, God will take care of your enemies. So number one, the foolish seldom know how to restrain themselves. And if you look at verses 11 through 15, amen, there's some serious things here. Amen. The Bible says the words of a wise person are gracious. The talk of a fool self-destructs. Isn't that something? He starts out talking nonsense <laughs> and ends up spouting insanity and evil. Because he doesn't know. She doesn't know any better. That's what they do. When you're without God, you don't know any better. The devil is going to fill you with everything that is evil. So don't worry about them. Know that God is with you. Verse 14 says, fools talk way too much. Chattering stuff they know nothing about. You don't have to try to convince them of what is right and wrong. A lot of Christians love to fight with people. Stop fighting with folk out there. Preach and teach the gospel and live in, in the gospel in, in the way you, 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 you act and react and let God take care of the rest. Amen. And then number two, let's look at that. Now, <laughs> folly and wisdom affect the condition of a country. Amen. Every country has its rulers. Amen. Verses 16 through 19 tells us this. Unlucky the land whose king is a child and whose princes party all night. Lucky the land whose king is mature. So unlucky the land is the prince or king who does those things. Wrong decisions will always catch up to our leader. Always. But the, the one that is, the land that is blessed, amen, that king is mature. Where the princes behave themselves and don't drink themselves silly. Verse 18 says, a lazy man lives in a tumble down shack. A lazy woman, woman ends up with a leaky roof. Laughter and bread go together and wine gives sparkle to life. But it's money that makes the world go round. If you don't work, you don't eat. But those are not the things that matter. Amen. God is who and what matters. He says, listen, if you have a job, if you have skills and gifts, enjoy life with what you can procure with your giftings with your skills, with your education, with the job that you were able to get because you are successful in all that you have done and your experience follows you. But those are not the things that matter. They may provide the joys for a moment, but it's the Lord that brings joy that lasts 
for the moment while we're living in this life and in the life to come. And number three, be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. The Bible tells us in verse 20, curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bed chamber. Let me read that again. This is important. Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Did you ever hear a phone call coming through to you? This happened to me. Someone talking about you and they didn't realize that they actually butt dialed you. Yeah. See, God knows how to take care of things. When you consider all the things that can happen in life, God can reveal some things to you. And so that little bird that you don't know is listening. So the Bible says, don't even, don't you dare talk about the king even in your bedchamber. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, don't curse the king. Don't curse someone, not even in your thought, because you're creating a mindset that will finally come through your mouth and be revealed through your actions. Anything you keep in your mind, if you begin to hate somebody, after a while, it's going to come out and it's going to manifest itself. So if you, you, you just hate that person and every time you see them, you're fuming you are setting yourself up to be used by Satan in so many different ways. And don't even talk about them because you never know who is listening. Preserve your job, sir. Preserve your job, ma'am. Because when you allow your emotions to run rampant, that's what the devil wants. As people of God, we're supposed to change. Keep the joy of the, the Lord in your heart. What, whatsoever things are, are perfect, amen. Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are of good report. The Bible lists so many things. The Bible says, think on these things. So let's think on these things and let's consider that all that God has for us, amen, he will give us in due time. So don't badmouth your, your leaders, not even under your breath. Don't abuse your leaders, even in the privacy of your home. Loose talk as a way of getting picked up and spread around. Little birds drop the crumbs of your gossip far and wide. And for parents, your children are listening and they're hearing what you're saying. And you're already creating and planting a seed of bitterness in the hearts of your children that will grow for years to come. So be careful what you say. We're going to end right here. And I want you to just consider all that is being taught here. The meaning of life is not just so that we can understand what is being said by the writer in the book of Ecclesiastes, but to understand that he was writing to help us, God's people, to make a shift in the way we think, make a shift in the way we act and react in our lives, to make a serious shift in our worldview, because we need to see the world the way God wants us to see the world. Amen? And so, curse not the rich in your bedchamber. For a little bird is listening. We're going to pray right now and ask God to bless you. We're going to ask the Lord to touch your hearts and your minds right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, I pray that something that was said here tonight, God will reach into the hearts of your children right now. I pray, God, that the word of God will go in and begin to make some changes, God, that people will begin to shift and to change, God, and to reset their thinking and the way they're looking at the world and the way they're looking at one another, the way that they even look at their enemy. Lord, you said that we're supposed to love our enemies. And so, God, I pray for your children tonight. May we honor you, God, by the way we live our lives so that others will see and hear and know that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, not just because of what we're saying, but how we're living, manifesting your glory, manifesting your goodness and the love of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Tonight, I'm so excited. Amen that you took the time to join us and uh, good to see so many online tonight. Amen. And thank you so much for all the comments that you've made. Hallelujah. We are grateful that God is blessing you and he will continue to bless you. Don't worry about the things that you're seeing in your life. Amen. Let me say that one more time before we end. Do not worry about the things that you're seeing in your life. Put it in God's hands. Amen. God bless you. I love you. And may the Lord be with you until we see you again on Sunday at 11 a.m. right here 
on Facebook Live. We love you. Bye-bye.